Today I'm gonna wrap up this season of teaching on faith. And I'll be truthful with you, this has been, to me it's been like, I'm seeing the whole topic of faith and the subject of faith in a completely different light than I've seen. And I've been studying this stuff for the past 30 something years. But there's something about the season that we're in right now. There's something about the Holy Spirit is, is moving once again on churches that are listening to his voice, okay? And stirring up this topic of faith. And, and I said this a couple weeks ago, that what we we're gonna start seeing is even international ministries and national ministries, you would see them begin to start teaching on faith. And my wife and I were just talking this week about how this one's teaching on faith now. And you turn the TV on. Yesterday I turned the TV on and it was a, a nationally known minister, actually internationally known from Canada, and he's teaching on faith. And that, there's all these other people teaching on faith. And it's like, man, I just knew in my heart this was a season the Holy Spirit was bringing us into. Um, why, what is the reason for this? Why is there such an urgency to, to get back to some of the basics of faith and to allow God to stir us up again? I don't know if you might have realized it or not, but the world has gone crazy. Have you realized that? <laughs> have you realized that even here in our country, our society is, is falling to pieces? It's just, you, you look at the news and you, you get on your feeds on Facebook and online and you go, well, what happened to this world? Where are things going, you know? And, and, and the, 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 the unfortunate thing is that the Bible told us, has been telling us, has been telling mankind for thousands of years, the days that we're living in right now, how they would be. And, and I just want to break this news to you, and I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but it's not going to get better. It kind of starts sliding downhill now until Jesus returns in person. So we're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy. We're seeing the unraveling of society. We're seeing uh, this spirit in this world that hates God and hates Jesus. We're seeing that spirit begin to manifest. You're seeing things become more and more difficult, even financially. I mean, people are getting back to jobs, but the jobs that they have are still not enough. Uh, people are, are, you know, things that seem like they're improving, but when you get down to it, it's not. And so we need faith to be operating now more than we ever have. God wants to use you, wants to use the church in general. I'm not talking about new beginnings, I'm talking about the church all over the world. Every believer, every person that says that Jesus Christ is their Lord and their Savior, every person that's received salvation, God wants to use to allow us to operate in faith on this earth to change some things, to stop some things, to stop the things that are going on in the world from affecting you. It doesn't have to affect us. I always go back to this illustration, which is speak so strongly from the Word of God. And the Word of God gives us the example of the Israelites in the wilderness, and especially when they were in Egypt, before they even left Egypt. Now you remember what was going on. God hit that, that kingdom with 10 different plagues, 10 different judgments came on that, on that nation. But if you'll notice this, it never affected God's people. Are, are you catching this? No matter what happened in Egypt, the Israelites were protected. If there was darkness in Egypt, there was light where they were. If the cattle were dying in Egypt, their cattle were prospering. And that is a picture of these last days that we're living in. Don't get caught up with what's going on in the world. Don't get caught up with all the evil. Don't get caught up with all the craziness. Don't get caught up with this whole system of darkness that just wants to strangle the life out of people. It's not our world. This is not our system. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. You and I belong to a different kingdom. You and I are citizens of heaven. And therefore, we're going to live from that, that system, uh, uh, that kingdom, not the one that, we're here, that we see here on earth. Now, here's a couple of major things I want to bring out to you today. Because after today, we're going to kind of move on to some other teaching and some other areas of ministry. And then we're going to come back to this in the future again, because I can see this is going to be a predominant theme uh, in the near future again. Here's what I want us to recognize. I, my, my goal today is to bring up some awareness. And one of those things that I really, really want us to aware, be aware of, I believe this is the Holy Spirit wants his church to be aware of, is that faith. The ability to trust God, the ability to trust the promises of God is actually in itself a gift from God. You and I do not have within us, apart from God, 
apart from when he created man, he created us with this ability to be able to believe him. Number one, for number one purpose, is so that we'd be able to believe what the Bible says about Jesus and we'd be able to, based on that belief, receive salvation. Well, what's, what does that mean? Well, we don't have to go to hell. And that's good news. I don't know about you, but I think that's good news. We don't have to go to hell. We can believe what the Bible says about Jesus. We can then, having, having established a system of belief in our heart about what Jesus has done for us, we can then receive salvation. Amen. That stops us from going to hell. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. Amen. I, I, don't want, I wouldn't want to spend a second there. Okay? Now, the other thing that we need to be aware of is that this faith that God has given us, this ability to believe Him, is what it takes for us to overcome the adversities of this life. Yes. Yes. Now, I just want to throw this out at you. Again, we're, 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 we're developing an awareness. We're kind of like stirring up my hope that we're stirring up some gratitude about these things. <clears throat> When God created Adam and Eve, when God created Adam and then, and then out of Adam he created Eve and created the garden for them to be in, there was nothing lacking there. It was a perfect environment for man. I, I just keep wanting to bring this up to your attention to remember how God originally intended for this earth to be. How God originally intended our lives to be. In that garden, we don't see sickness. In that garden, we don't see poverty. In that garden, we don't see depression. In that garden, we don't see addictions. In that garden, we don't see anything that we see today. And today, we think this is normal life. This is way. So no, this is not normal. We're not supposed to get sick. We're not supposed to suffer poverty. We're not supposed to suffer depression. We're not supposed to be enslaved by things. This came in as a result of sin coming into this world. And in effect, we let sin come into this world. Now, what kind of God would he have been if he just left us? Well, this is the consequence of your decisions. No, God is love. Amen. And so instead of, instead of pulling back from earth, instead of pulling away from mankind, what does he instill in us? Faith. Yes. Faith now gives us the edge over everything that the devil tries to do in our life. And it's important for us to operate this way because when you and I operate in faith, it doesn't only affect us, it affects everyone around us. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, remember, develop a gratitude, develop an attitude of thanksgiving because God gave us faith as a gift. With that gift, you and I overcome the works of the enemy. Amen? Amen. You got that. Now, again, I'm going to have to skip around here a little bit. One of the things or I should say two things that I definitely want us to leave with today as we step out of this and into a new season is this. Number one, we need to know how faith operates. There's no use us knowing about faith, no use us having this grateful heart to God about the fact that he gave us faith without understanding how to use faith. Because you see, the Bible that you possess, whether it's in phone, in your phone, or some other kind of device, or whether it's a book sitting on your lap, or you got it at home, that Bible is full of words of faith. It's full of promises from God. But there's only one problem. They remain words on a page until someone operates in them. Amen. Are you catching this? We found out through examples in the Word of God, and we're going to go to some of them, that faith is released. Now, if you were here last Wednesday night, faith is released through words and through action. Okay? I got a couple of people to remember. We're going to go through this drill real quick. Now, let me see. You both, how, many, how many people have at least one hand here? Let me see. The rest of you would just, how many people have at least, okay. Now, follow me with this here. You need to understand, you need to get this in you. Why? Because a year from now, somebody's going to say something that's going to trigger this phrase. Say this with me, ready? Faith is released through words and action. Now, we'll be here all afternoon if you want. Faith is released through words and action. Let's see your hands. Make believe you're Italian. Okay? Faith is released through words and action. One more time. Faith is released through what? Words and action. How is faith released? Words and action. That's the only way faith is released. That's the only way faith is released. How do we know? Because we see it at work in the Bible. The most practical thing that God has ever given us is faith. It's the easiest thing in the world to operate in when you realize how it works. Now, in Mark chapter 5, there's a story about a woman who was bleeding for 12 years. 
12 years. Imagine having a hemorrhage for 12 years. And it says she kept growing weak. She spent all the money she had on doctors and only grew worse. Now, one day, she, it says she heard about Jesus. Well, what did she hear? She must have heard that Jesus was going about from city to city, village to village. He was doing what? Opening up blind eyes, opening up deaf ears. The mutes are speaking. Paralyzed people are walking. Dead are being raised. Lepers are being cleansed. So based on what she heard, she began to say, if I could just touch the very hem of his robe, I shall be healed. Now, now watch the way that works. She heard about Jesus. Romans chapter 10 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So what she heard, she allowed to develop as a belief system in her heart. She came to the conclusion that what she was hearing about Jesus, she decided to believe. Therefore, based on what she believed in her heart, she now began to speak. And she began to say, if I could just get, if I could just grab a hold of the, the bottom of his robe, I'll be healed. Now, watch. She began to say this, but she just didn't sit in her house. Because faith is released through words and Action. she gets out of her house and she goes to where Jesus is. She struggles through the crowds. And without him knowing that she's even there, she reaches forth and she grabs hold of her, grabs hold of his garment, his robe. And the Bible says that immediately Jesus perceived that power had gone out from him. And he stopped the crowds and he stopped her and the disciples around him and he goes, who touched me? I can just picture this, picture especially Peter, like, are you kidding me? What, is he losing it? There's thousands of people here. He wants to know who touched him. But Jesus said, no, no, no. No, somebody touched me different. Because when you, when, you, when you reach out in faith towards God and you have faith, there's a reaction that takes place. It's your faith. When it's released, are you speaking what you claim you believe and taking action accordingly? When that meets with the grace of God, it causes an explosion. And that's what happened to that woman. The grace of God just shot out of Jesus. And it says, went into her body, and immediately she perceived. Immediately she knew, I'm healed. Amen. Jesus is wanting to know who this person is. And she, finally she, she falls down in front of him, and she confesses, this is, who, this, you know, this is what I did. And what does he say to her? Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Whose faith was it? Hers. Now, who was responsible for this healing? Was Jesus? No, he doesn't even know she's there. She sets the framework of how this miracle is going to take place by saying what she believed in her heart. She was convinced that if she got to where he was and if she just grabbed a hold of his garment, she was going to be healed. Amen. Now, do you think that only worked with her? No. It works with us too. Amen. You will determine the parameters in which God will release a miracle into your life. It's not about what he can do. It's about what you can believe and what you can receive. Are you listening to me? We'll show you some more instances in the word of God. But let me give you a personal story. Years and years ago, I was only, this is probably about 30 years ago, I was only a Christian for a few years when this happened. My father had gotten injured in a construction job years before that and needed to go for surgery. Now, I was only a believer a couple of years. I really didn't hardly knew anything. And, but if you would have asked me at that point in time, is your dad a believer? Is he, is he born again? I would said, I don't think so, no. Uh, I think he knows that God exists, but I don't know if he has that kind of relationship. Dad, I'm talking about. And so we went to the hospital, my wife and I, you know, he put him in the day before he's going to have the surgery. And, uh, you know, I said, Dad, we, you know, we want to pray with you as, as much as I knew how to pray at that point in time. And I, said, and I said this to him. I said, how do you think this is going to go? What am I doing? I want to find out where he's at. Why? Because that's important. So, so in his broken English, he said to me, well, I believe, uh, you know, God is going to help the doctors and I'm going to be okay. That was all he said. I was worried to tell you the truth. All right? But what has up happened? The next day we go to visit him after he's had the surgery. The day after he has the surgery, he's standing up in the bathroom shaving. <laughs> this is delicate back surgery. They operated on his spine. And yet the day after the surgery, he's standing up by himself shaving in the bathroom. 
What happened here? What happened? God honored the words that he spoke. He was convinced in his heart that between the doctors and God helping the doctors that he was going to be okay. Are you hearing me? What happened? God honored. In other words, Jesus said many times, let it be done unto you according to your faith. There's some of us that hold back because we think it has to be a certain way. We think it has to line up a certain way. No. What are you believing in your heart? Most of the time, God's going to do it the way you're believing it. Why? He loves you, and he wants to meet you where you're at. Now, he might not keep it that way. Next time, he might do it a different way. But for that particular time, just like with that woman there, she said, if I could just get to his garment... If I could just grab a hold of it, I'll be healed. It happened exactly the way she said it was going to happen. Yes. Are you catching this? Yes. Now, in Acts chapter 14, we've got the story there about Paul. Paul is traveling to a city named Lystra. He's preaching. And it says there that while in, in, the, in the audience that he's preaching to, Acts chapter 14, I believe. Yeah, it is. Acts chapter 14. He says, there was a man there that is lame from birth. In other words, he's been born crippled. He's never walked in his life. And he's sitting there listening to Paul preach. Now, next verse. This man did what? Heard. He heard Paul speaking. He heard Paul speaking. What do you think Paul was speaking? Well, if you follow Paul's career through the, through the scriptures, Paul had one main message. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is anointed by God. He's come to this earth to break the powers of darkness off of our life. He's come. He's the Son of God. He came to die on the cross, and he came to raise again from the dead. Every place he went, that's what he preached. Okay? Now, this man, it says, here was listening to him. Paul speak, and Paul observing him intently. Paul's watching him. Paul's seeing this guy's getting it, just like I can stand up here sometimes, and I can see the light bulb go off in people. And I, 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 they're getting it. They're getting it. It's clicking. It's clicking. Faith is very perceivable. It very, very much is. So now, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, what does he do? Paul says with a loud voice, Stand up, straight on your feet. And he lived and walked. Well, what happened? This guy's been crippled his whole life. He doesn't even know how to walk. What happened? Faith, at some point while Paul was preaching, in some split second of time, that man made the decision in his heart, what this man is saying about this Jesus is true. And then Paul offers him a challenge and commands him, he doesn't notice it and say, hey, listen, see if you can stand up. Or why don't you try to wiggle your toe? No, Paul says, stand up. And what does a man do? I'll guarantee you, when we get to heaven and talk to this guy, he's going to say, I didn't even give it a second thought. When he said stand up, I stood up. Why? Because faith was released from his heart. And faith is released with what? Words and action. So what was the action required? Stand up. Stand up. And he stood up. Now watch this now. Now watch this now. It took faith for Paul to say that. But it took corresponding faith for that man to cooperate with what Paul said. How many times did we talk ourselves out of a miracle because we think about it too much? You listening to me? Your situation, the adversity that you're facing, the challenge that you're facing... Whatever it is that's coming against your life that you know is not lining up with God's plan for you is not going to change until you begin to speak what God says about the situation and until you begin to take action according to what God has already said. Amen. Now, watch this now. Do I have to rush today? Can I take my time a little bit? Well, the rest of you can... <laughs> there are times, listen to me, there are times when God wants to take you to another level of faith that he might not want to do it the way he did it the last time. I'm assuming that I'm talking to people who actually have needs. I'm assuming that I'm talking to people that come in contact with adversity. Is there anybody in here that's ever had any adversity in your life? Just one, two, three. The rest of you are like... Okay. So, what's going to cause us to overcome an area of adversity? It's going to have to be our faith. Now, usually God will do something one way, like with this woman with the issue, but he did it that way. 
But maybe the next time, God might want to do something different. Maybe he might want you to respond differently because he's already shown you what he's like. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever had God really show you a miracle in your life? Let me see your hands. Amen. Amen. Now, we have an incident in the Word of God that's exactly what I'm talking about, where an individual knew that God was capable of doing something, and God challenges him a different way. And let's see what happens. In John chapter 4, there's a story of a man that he's referred to as a nobleman. But, and he takes place, the story takes place in Cana. Now, when I mention the name of the city Cana, what do you think of? The wedding where Jesus turned the water into wine. And look, it reminds us right here. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. Now that's significant that you remember that association between Cana and turning the water into wine. Now watch it. And there was a certain nobleman. Now a nobleman could be somebody of royalty, could be somebody in a political position or somebody, uh, uh, some type of an official uh, in that town, maybe either set by the Romans or whatever. Somebody important, some big shot, okay? And this man, he's got a son who's sick, but the son is in Capernaum. Now, Cana and Capernaum is a pretty good distance between each other. All right? He comes to Jesus. He had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee. And he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for his son is at the point of death. What's saying? Jesus, come and heal my son. My son's dying. Okay? Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll by no means believe. In other words, you want more evidence, don't you? You, you need me to come there. He said, unless somebody does spectacular things for you, you don't believe, do you? He's really reprimanding this man. You say, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Well, I don't know what Jesus you've been reading about, because the Jesus I read about went into the temple and knocked over everybody's tables. He, 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 you don't want to get on his, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, so <laughs> the nobleman, instead of responding to this kind of reprimand, He's like, look, all I care about is my kid's sick. Sir, come down before my child dies. Look at Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. But, but he wanted you to come there. He asked you to come to Capernaum so that his son would be healed. And Jesus goes, go your way, your son lives. So the man what? He did what? He believed. He believes what? What Jesus just said. And how did we have, what proof do we have that he believed? He went his way. What did Jesus tell him to do? Go home, your son's fine. What, what is this all about? Because this doesn't sound like Jesus. It doesn't sound like the one that we think in our heads what Jesus is supposed to. You, we think Jesus is supposed to go, oh, okay, I'll come to your house. But now watch this, man. This man's a what? A nobleman? And he's, he lives, what city? What city is he from? What city is he from? Cana. What happened at Cana? The water was turned into wine. Let me ask you this question. This man's a nobleman. He lives in Cana. We're not talking about New York City with millions of people. In, back in those days when somebody had a wedding, everybody in the city's invited. That man was at that wedding when Jesus turned the water into wine. What is Jesus trying to do here? Jesus is trying to say to him, what did he try to say? Hey, you were there when I turned the water into wine. You saw the miracle that I worked, and you still need me to come down there? What's he doing? He's challenging him to come up to a new level of faith. What does he say? Go your way. Your son lives. The man believed. Are you seeing this now? Now watch this now. At this point in time, Jesus doesn't meet him where he's at. At this point in time, Jesus invites him to come to a new level of faith. See, you were there when you saw the water get turned into wine. You drank the wine. You tasted it. You know the story. They're still talking about it to this day. How is it that you still need me to come down there? You, you know what I'm capable of, or you wouldn't have come and asked me to come and hear your son. So listen. Now you're going to have to believe differently. Go your way, your son lives. And the man believed. He goes home, and look what happens. And now as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Well, yeah. Jesus, what did Jesus say to him? Go home, your son lives. Yeah. Yeah. Then he, the nobleman, inquired of them, the servants, the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. 
So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And watch this now. He himself believed. But now watch this now. This is a different belief. See, he believed the word, your son lives, go home. That was one faith. You got this? Now, now, he not only believes that Jesus is capable of healing, but now he believes this is the Messiah. And he and his whole household, what? Believed. Now, why did I bring that point up? Is to tell you this. When you operate in faith, everybody around you gets affected by it. You got people that you're praying for to get saved. You got people that you're praying for that would get born again, that they would receive Christ, that they would come to church, that they would start reading their Bible. And you're praying and you're praying and you're praying when you should be living your life out in front of them and living in faith. Because all of a sudden they go, wait a second, that person was sick, they're ready to die. And all of a sudden they're healed and they're fine. They're back to work. What does it do? That gets people's attention. People in your life, they know maybe you've been in financial crisis for years and all of a sudden now you start believing God and trusting God and you start operating in faith and all of a sudden they see that things are turning around. What do they think? What do they start to say something? You know what? If I didn't see this with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it. This person was sick and now they're healed. This person was poor and now they're doing good. They had a car that was falling apart in front of them. Now they're driving around in a brand new car. They're living in a nice house. What happens? That affects the people around you. People know you. And they say to themselves, man, their marriage used to be in a shambles, but look at this now. You never sense so much love when you walk in that house, all you sense is love. What does it do? It gets their attention. This man's entire household was affected by the fact that he walked in faith. Are you listening to me today? Or is this going right over your head? Do you hear what I'm saying? You want your household affected? You want your neighbors? You want your coworkers? You want your friends? You want them all? Start walking in faith and let them see you operate in faith and you see how their lives turn around. Amen? Amen? You're going to give me five more minutes? Are you going to give me five more minutes? Okay. The next thing I want you to leave with, this is the most important thing that I can share with you today, is faith is a shield. A shield. Okay, the Apostle Paul was very familiar with the Romans, with their soldiers. He was imprisoned a couple of times. The Roman soldiers were all over Israel, all over that area of the world. They were known for being fierce, They were known for their weapons. They were known for their tactics. He observed some things, and that's why he wrote this in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul wrote this, verse 13. Therefore take up the whole arm of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, look at verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield, Mr. Roman soldier, can you get your shield? Um, The shield would be made up of wood, almost looked like a door. It was so big, be able to, an entire a soldier would be able to stand behind this thing and be able to be protected. Yeah. That shield would be made of wood, but they, what they were made with, with wood, they would cover it with layers of leather. Okay? And then before they would go to battle, they would soak those shields in water so that the shield and leather would absorb that water so that when they were on the battlefield and their enemies are shooting arrows that they were on fire, when those arrows would hit that shield that was soaked in water, they would be quenched. The fire would go out. You catch the picture here? And Paul's observing this and Paul's understanding this and Paul makes the spiritual connection. Wow, this is how our faith works. And he says, above all, taking the shield of what? Faith. With which you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. And what is that faith shield going to be made out of? It's made out of the word of God. Are you listening to me? And so here we have an example. We have our, our Roman soldier here. And so we have an example here of that shield of faith. That shield is made up of scriptures. Now let me just, let me just, if I show up on the battlefield with just one plank, <laughs> oh, go away, Mr. Devil. Just, just go away. And so every time those darts are coming, I'm like, but, but inevitably, one of them are going to hit. Now you see, this goes back to a principle in the Word of God way back in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's this principle that's released and it pertains to the rest of the Word of God. 
It says this, and it pertains really more to a person giving testimony in a court case. It says this, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, in other words, according to the testimony of at least two or three, at least two or three people, let every fact be established. Now that's a principle through the word of God. Jesus himself operated in that same principle. You remember when he's in the wilderness and the devil came to him to tempt him? Three times he's tempted and three times Jesus said, it is written. And hits the enemy back with a scripture. Are you following me here? Now, this particular shield we've designed to counter an attack of fear. Now, let me just say this up ahead of time, all right? Every adversity that you face is going to require a shield. Your health is going to require a shield. Your marriage is going to require a shield. Your peace of mind is going to require a shield. Your finances, your, your financial health is going to require a shield because you're going to get attacked in all these different areas and you can't interchange your shields because whatever scriptures pertain to one thing might not pertain to the other. Are you getting this? Are you learning anything today? So let's go through this opera. Let's build our shield of faith. You get attacked with fear. You start having an anxiety attack. You're starting to panic. And what do we do? We're going to go to the Word of God. And 2 Timothy, for, uh, verse 1, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 12, I know in whom I have believed, and I'm convinced he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him to that day. Paul wrote this. Why? Because Paul was constantly being attacked. Paul was constantly being ridiculed. Paul was constantly under threat of his life, threat of, of being stoned to death, threat, threat of being thrown out of town, riots, all this other stuff broke out. Here's a man who's got to constantly deal with fear. So what does he do? God gives him this revelation of the promises of God. And we have those today. So you get attacked with fear, you pick up one of those scriptures. Next one is, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life or the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27 verse 1. We've got another plank on the shield. Isaiah 41 10. So do not fear for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What do you got now? We're building our shield. Are you getting this? And then finally, we throw the last one on there, which you could probably all repeat with me. 2 Timothy 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Now what? You, you get, now you're, you're behind this shield. And every attack that's coming at you, you go, oh yeah? You want to throw some more? Here. And you put that shield up, and what happens? Every one of those arrows hits that scripture. And you start speaking with your mouth, right? Because faith is released how? With words and action. You start speaking. Oh, no, 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 devil. No, no, no. You try to put that fear on me. You used to get away with it before. You used to keep me up all night crying. You used to make me vomit all over the place because I get these panic attacks. But you know what? No. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. This is how we fight our battles. You take your shield and you put them up against every attack of the enemy. So now your health gets attacked. What do you start doing? You bet, and, and truthfully, you really shouldn't start it when the attack comes. We should all go home this afternoon and start building our shields because you're going to need to have an entire arsenal at your disposal. Why? Because the enemy is relentless and he's going to try to come at you in all different ways. He may attack you one time with fear. He may attack your health the next time. Maybe the next time he attack your finances. He might attack your marriage. He might attack your family. He might attack whatever. He might attack your identity. Whatever it is, you're going to have to know what the Word of God says so that you can throw that shield up. Are you getting this today? Because this is the difference between life and death. So now my health gets attacked. I don't feel good. Something's wrong. I know there's something different in my body. So I go to the doctor. The doctor tells me, oh, this doesn't look good at all. All right? So what do you do? You're going to fall down and say, oh, God, oh, God. No. You go, okay, doctor, thank you. Here's your money. Let me go home. And you go, you go home. What do you do? You start building your shield. Amen. Isaiah 53 says, and by his stripes I was healed. You're getting this? Psalm 103. Not only is he forgiven my sins, but he's healed all my diseases. Exodus chapter 15. I am the Lord that heals you. Amen. You see where I'm going? You start throwing all those scriptures together. What happens? The time the pain comes, shh, here's my shield. The enemy comes, oh, you better start planning your funeral because you're not going to make it. Oh, no, no, devil. Here's my shield. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yes. You're losing your house. You can't pay your bills. Your car's going to get repossessed. Your job's like this. What are you going to do? You, you, go, you get home, you get in the Word of God, and you start finding out what God says. You find out that He tells us in Psalms, I delight in the prosperity of my servants. He revealed through the Apostle John that above all things, He prays that we be in good health and that we would prosper as our soul prospers. You know the evidence of your soul prospering? You having a good shield. Are you catching this? This is how we're going to fight our battles. This is how it's done. You notice that this is a defensive 
weapon? The, the darts come. The thoughts come. The attacks come. What are you going to do? You're going to throw that shield up there. And you're going to get behind it, and you're going to let that shield protect you from every attack of the enemy. Are you getting this? I pray that you've got something today. I pray that I've been able to inspire you to get in the Word of God. Go and find out ahead of time. Go, just do it, do it practically. Go home and just get yourself some, some, some little cards or something or, or however you put it on your phone. Do whatever you're going to do and just get all these different shields built. What are you going through right now? Whatever the situation you're going through right now, start there. And so get yourself three, four, five scriptures that you know when that attack comes, oh, no, no, I'm not going to think on the attack. I'm going to throw my shield up. Man, I pray that you get this today. I pray that you not just get it because words of faith is released through words and action. I pray that you take the action and literally go start putting these, because you know what this is? This is, every shield is a statement of faith based on what you believe God's gonna do about your situation. Amen. You need to have that at your disposal. Amen? Amen. 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 Why don't you stand up? Thank you, Roman soldier. I'm going to pray this short prayer over us. I believe God that the Holy Spirit's going to keep reminding you to take some action in these areas because truthfully, so many of us are getting steamrolled by the devil and it shouldn't be this way. It should not be this way. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus that you would bring to our remembrance, Lord God, everything that we've learned in this series, Father. I pray, God, that you would stir us up to action, that the Holy Spirit would inspire us and give us a particular way that's meaningful to each and every person here that they particularly would latch onto and build the shield of faith so that when the enemy comes with those fiery darts, Lord God, every single one of them will be extinguished. And not only will we be able to protect ourselves and not only be able to stop the attack in our lives, but Father, when there's those around us that don't know yet, that, haven't, that Jesus is not in their life yet, that we'd be able to say, come on, get behind me, get behind my shield, and come on, together, we'll fight this attack. Father, that your love would be expressed and manifested to all those around us. Thank you for giving us faith, Father. Thank you for giving us a strategy now to put it into practice in a very practical way. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.